Hello and welcome to another episode of Oh What a Lovely Podcast, where popular culture meets the First World War. I'm Angus Wallace and with me as ever is Jessica Meyer, Chris Kempshall and joining us once more is Emma Hanna. So in this episode, we're going to be discussing music and we've asked Emma back as she's a new book out, Sounds of War, Music in the British Armed Forces During the Great War. And so, uh, so Emma, you're the perfect person to talk to on the topic. Uh, welcome back. So I read your book last week and thoroughly enjoyed it. So um, what got you started thinking about music and the First World War? Well, it's one of those things, isn't it, where sort of your experiences from your uh, past sort of come up, creep up on you in in your present work. I, I actually trained originally as a classical cellist when I was 18. I went up to Manchester, I had a scholarship with the Lindsay String Quartet, um, and I did a year first year of a music degree because I was uh, training to be a, a cellist you know as wonderful as Manchester is and Manchester University is a wonderful place the, the Lindsay's were wonderful people I decided by the end of that summer that professional music wasn't for me uh, this was you know the, the late 1990s all the orchestras were being disbanded I didn't fancy being a soloist and the idea of being a music teacher made made me uh, want to jump off the nearest cliff so I, I jumped ship and did what I, I always wanted to do in the sixth form, which was go and be a historian. So I, I left the cello back in uh, 1997 and uh, didn't look back until I started thinking about what new areas of the Great War hadn't been yet studied. And certainly from my experience of looking at televisual representations of the first war, you know, the, the aural part, you know, the... You know, the, the sense of, of, of how music was used as part of the televisual representation and the sort of the contemporary memory space that music has such an important part of. I, I just started looking in, into that. And I, I did start with um, the big names. I started with the high culture stuff. I was, you know, Ray Form, Williams, Butterworth, but very quickly worked out particularly with the help of a few musicologists that were most put out that a historian wanted to look at these um, that these figures and they were doing fine on their own. Thank you very much. Um, the really interesting stuff that no one had done yet was about the more popular music stuff. But also I really wanted to get onto the front lines. I wanted to get a sense of what music was being heard and played and enjoyed and sung actually in the, the armed forces at the time you know what role did music have and I said I wanted to to you know this sort of the area I'm looking at is that, that sort of intersection between military history and cultural history and I thought the more research I did it was a really rather organic process it, it took me down all these fascinating alleys to prisoner of war camps plane cockpits aerodromes ships all sorts of places hospitals and it really, it was a long, it was a long research, this one. It did took eight years. I did have a, a baby in that time as well in my defence. But it, it really did evolve into the role that music played at work, rest and play, but also in, in on land, sea and air as well. I didn't want to just to do a book about army concert parties. Um, I thought in for a penny and for a pound. I think once you've, you've written... As, as we all know, once once you've uh, written one book, you kind of have a voice in your head already knowing what people are going to say to certain things. Um, so I thought, you know, let's do it all. You know, the musical experiences of, of the armed forces. There was also a, l a little matter of the centenary in there, I seem to recall, because you came and gave a, a great paper at Leeds, and it must have been in 2014 or 2015 as part of the centenary, um, which... Yeah, my t great takeaway with that was about how much the the armed forces were didn't like Tipperary, but the government was pushing it as as the military song of choice or the, the army song of choice, and and of course there was an, an organic move towards the more sentimental songs, which I found really interesting. Yeah, and that that, that was great. It was, wasn't really the government that was pushing. I think it was the the civilians uh, and certainly sort of the the music publishers, the sheet music. Uh, publishers uh, were really pushing it towards, um, you know, to, for it being sung in cinemas uh, and theatres. It was really sort of jumped upon uh, once George Kernick, the Daily Mail war correspondent, said, reported that he'd heard soldiers disembarking in France singing Tipperary. It suddenly became the ultra 
patriotic thing to do as, as civilians to, to sing that you felt like you were at one with troops so it's sort of really much it was more of a, a really sort of grassroots thing that the civilians thought they were showing their unity with, with the troops singing this song whereas you know by that christmas they hated it is, is the army hoovering up popular songs i mean because there's an explosion in uh, yeah, the size of the army so does the I mean, the British. It, it, does the British Army have a musical tradition that sort of gets overwritten with popular songs of the era, rather than banging out the same old military tunes? Well, there was a real tension um, between this, this sense of um, you know the new musical stuff, which was seen as very lowbrow, between what the the army you know traditionally had its its own various songs. You know, from you see the Crimea, you see it in India. Uh, in South Africa, there, there are traditional army songs. I think a lot of them came off, you know, prison ships uh, and, and things like that. You do see the influence of popular songs with so many civilians coming in to the forces. And that's what a lot of them liked to sing. So you see this sort of admixture of the traditional and the new. Uh, but certainly, um, you know, one of the, the, the many fun organisations that I uncovered during my research for, for this book was the um, Naval and Military Musical Union. They were formed um, in about 1908, 1909 to really improve servicemen's music. Um, so, so for the Army and the Navy, there was this sense that, uh, especially a lot of the reforms with Haldane uh, in, the, in sort of around 1909, 1910, um, this sense that traditional military music should be retained and that soldiers and sailors should still have music that was deemed as pure, that was uninfected by these new musical songs, that the traditions would, would still be there. Um, and, and certainly those musical competitions of, of getting soldiers and sailors uh, to form up choirs, and to perform against one another, these, these glee parties, as they used to call them, and compete against one another. The Royal Engineers down in Chatham were particularly good at them because a, a lot of the, uh, their officers were involved in this in the unit. So there's this sense of, I think it, it sort of really pertains to that, that the concerns about degeneracy and decay that come after the experience of the Boer War, of the Second Boer War, 1899 to 1902. Was this particularly aimed at the territorials, this idea of getting civilian men imbued with military traditions or was this something more for the regular forces and keeping them pure and separate? A, a bit of both I think definitely for the regular forces but so anyone that had anything to do with the forces should still be able to retain the sense of proper proper music being sung in any outpost of the empire they're taking that bit of music that's that's untouched by some of those filthy songs um, that were on the gramophone. So even even some people didn't like recorded music. They thought there was something really um, impure about the gramophone. How resistant or cooperative were soldiers to this? Because it sounds like the type of thing that gets announced to them of, you know, we've decided that to protect you from impure music, we've organised this association and we're going to therefore, you know, maintain pure, uninfected military music and you're all just going to have to live with it. How... It, it, did soldiers like this kind of the, having a top-down approach to you know these are the things you're allowed to sing these are the things you're not allowed to sing i didn't actually find much about soldiers reaction to that and i think really if anything if this is happening in the evening um you know as part of canteen culture you know if there's beer at the end of it i think they'd have been fine with it i mean it's um but that was generally the thing you know a lot of these you know the, the whole um sort of recreational space uh, these were happening in the evenings, you know, smoking concerts were a, a, a large uh, part of rest and recreation with the forces. And this was sort of, it, you know, saying that, you know, you form up your glee clubs anyway, try singing these songs and we can get together with other units and you can compete against each other. There's even a shiny silver trophy that the bandmaster of the Royal Engineers contacted me about uh, when the book came out and said, there's, there are these trophies in the basement. Is this what they're for? And they were National Music, Naval and Military Musical Union trophies from 1911. Um, and I said, yes, you, you won that in 1911, your unit, for, for being the best giver. So I think, you know, a lot of this is, is tied together with the existing regime of rec rest and recreation. And if the soldiers can get together and have a smoke and a drink afterwards, which, which was 
the, the, the general pattern all to the good. One thing I did note the, is the National Service League had a songbook, a military songbook as well, and they're obviously pressing for conscription. Do the army sort of go in, go into the First World War with a sort of an official song list that are all frightfully patriotic, rousing uh, sort of songs that they're, they're singing, you know, Heart of Oak and all those kind of things, Onward Christian Soldiers type of songs? Yeah, nail on the head, absolutely. They're all there. You know, Royal Britannia's always there. Obviously, the national anthem because that would close uh, every concert. Um, yes, the I mean, Hearts of Oak is a big one. Um, here's for the red, white, and blue. All of the songbooks like that. And it was really interesting the research I did. So you know, the the pamphlet you mentioned there, and also the YMCA. You know, they produced their own songbooks. Again, this this idea of these these piano compilations that would always be with the YMCA piano in one of their in one of their huts. Uh, again, to try. To, to encourage the right signed sort of music. And do, do, him, do hymns appear at all? Um... Hugely, yes, very, very popular. And, and certainly as, um, as time goes on, hymn tunes are sort of ready-made for the soldiers' own songs. And you see it in the Air Force as well, and certainly the, the, um, the flow between, you know, a lot of uh, Royal Flying Corps people come from the army. So you see this transfer of songs and... Um, between units but hymns him, are ready packaged yeah they're very good are hymns a leveler because everyone knows them and presumably as this as the century wears on the gramophone can replace hymns being other music that people listen to that's not church music i think they they perform different functions i mean hymns would always be sung obviously every sunday at church parade but those the, the hymn tunes are just ready made for soldiers to make up whatever words they wanted to which which could really vary. The gramophone, you know, most units had a gramophone, even in a frontline dugout. Usually the officers would have a gramophone or one would get shared, shared around. And that's really more for, you know, the, the sort of the rest times where they could sit back and have a smoke and the gramophone would be on in the background. Hymns, very much more for more active times. So you, you, hymns being sung on the march generally. Um, someone would strike up. Uh, a hymn-like song, but with different words. Uh, and they particularly liked um, taking their own regimental songs, um, but they rarely ever, you know, each regiment would have its own regimental march, um, but they would rarely ever sing the, the words that they were supposed to sing. They, again, they would have their, their own versions of, of that, depending on which unit it was and, and at what point in the war. There's an awful lot of you know, sort of ebb and flow of, of what's popular at different times. And certainly it's very, you know, it's part of that unit's identity to have their own types of song. And there'd always be, you know, various characters there who would be good performers, good singers who might lead, uh, might lead the songs, who would be asked to, to strike up a, a song and everyone would follow. And can we just talk about musicians? Because I have a student who's been writing about bandsmen. Um, and military bandsmen as part of her PhD. Um, so, so there are actually men within the units who, who are specifically there to play music, aren't there? Yeah. The, the regular army units would have, you know, before the war had their own bands. You know, the majority had their own uh, bands and they were trained as bandsmen, you know, especially in infantry units. They would also be infantrymen, but they were there generally to, to be bandsmen. When the regular units go um, over to, to France and Flanders, a lot of them are told to leave their instruments at home. I think some of them still take them. And then, you know, those that didn't take their instruments, the bandsmen over there, really missed them and started to send for them. The, the real problem is the new units uh, that are being created don't automatically have, you know, the same privileges or the same expectations as, as the regular units. And that's that was what I was really interested to see. Well, how did they get their music? And the answer increasingly seemed to be that the band, the, pe the people in the new units, men in the new units who have musical ability or, or instrumentalists, because hundreds of thousands of people earned their living as 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 musicians, um, you know, in an era uh, where every theatre, every cinema um, had to have a, a house band. Um, you know, many pubs would have resident pianists, things like that. They would they would get together and organise their own band. And particularly this was so where Salvation Army bandsmen, uh, of which there were tens of thousands, over 50,000, 
Salvation Army bandsmen went to serve uh, in the British forces. So once they arrived and saw that there was there were no there was no provision, no expectation, because obviously you know the focus is on other things at the time. There's this sense of you know particularly from commanders uh, who are in, who wanted music or who wanted to encourage music but weren't given the time, the resources to do so, were very relieved when they had a group of men with musical experience saying, we can get a band together. And they just did it. Uh, and they, they became, you know, the, the, the new unit's bandsmen. And that's, that's as close as I can get to what actually happened on the ground, is it was, it was a very organic process. And the soldiers, um, much to the commander's relief, did it themselves. Is the music being generated a two-way process? Is music is popular music coming from the front? Sorry, is popular music coming from home to the soldiers? And are sometimes soldiers popularizing music and sending it back, or is it is it a two-way street when when tunes become popular at the period? There's definitely a flow. Um, you can see it in gramophone records, particularly, um, particularly among officers. Anyone who went home on leave was expected to bring gramophone, new discs, gramophone discs, and they always need needles as well. They go through needles like anything uh, for the gramophones. Anyone who went home was expected to bring back new records or and or sheet music. Um, and it, often you see it in letters as well, asking um, for, for fresh discs. Either they've worn them out or they're, uh, worn them out actually, or they're fed up of listening to the same ones. Um, because you can only get so many plays out of them. Um, you know, they wear out uh, gramophone discs. So anyone who went on leave or often from home are being requested, please send us some gramophone records. Uh, please send us some sheet music um, to have in the mess. And often it was the West End shows, you know, like Chi Chin Chow, Made of the Mountains, you know, the, the, the big, the Bing Boys Are Here, The Review. The songs that got performed there were sort of the big hits of their time. And they were the, often the ones that were coming back on the discs and the sheet music, particularly. Are there songs or um, kind of favourite parts, bits of music, or that kind of get a lot of uh, either play or appreciation that kind of end up being kind of limited to, to theatre? So, you know, are, are there songs that are really popular for the troops in Salonika or the troops in uh, Gallipoli versus the troops in on the Western Front? Are there... Are there places where like a little mini musical culture springs up where this is what we like here and it's slightly different to what soldiers are listening to elsewhere in, in the front or in the war i'm not sure about that i didn't sort of sense much difference i mean obviously those that are serving in france and flanders are literally a, within a day of the west end of london so you would have thought that they you know, their proximity uh, to home would have been better but from, from what I saw uh, it just took longer to get out to Salonika um, they would still have uh, the similar tunes they would still be asking for the same sheet music it would just take a little bit longer to get out there um, but from what I, I could sense it's it, it's it's very similar but I, I could be wrong with further research for those that go go into this area themselves it'd be interesting to see it's a good question and what, what about sort of cultural dialogue between allies um, or even within the empire? So, you know, are there things that Australian or Canadian troops are listening to that they then introduce British troops to? Do, do, do the French and the British swap records or do the Americans bring a whole new type of music when when they come? Yeah, that's, it's a really good thing. It's a, it's a really good avenue, actually. I may, I may even, you know, I warn you now, there may be an article in this uh, hibernating. Not so much between the French, although I do see that a lot of concert parties were were open to French soldiers as well. Um, you know, they were welcome there. They were very British affairs, but as as allies, they they were welcome. And certainly uh, with the big theatres, when you see some of the YMCA concert parties go over with Lena Ashwell, if they've got a decent theatre that's out of the range of guns, there's often a, a you know fifty percent of the tickets must be made available to French soldiers as well. But definitely you see it when the Americans come. I mean, the Foxtrot starts 1914, but certainly the, the influence of jazz from 1917 onwards is, is huge. Uh, you know, bits of jazz get uh, are there before the Americans, but certainly you see the influence of um, American music really increases as, as, as they 
the rides in Europe. I'm now just trying to imagine marching to jazz. It has to be said, is the, is the image in my head. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's a sort of that sort of swing style, um, you know, there's sort of, um, and certainly Mike Hammond's done some great work on blues in the trenches. I remember he came to uh, our, our conference that we did uh, at Kent and, and presented a paper on blues in the trenches. So that influence of of, um, of, of jazz musicians is is very key. And certainly there were references, uh, particularly with the Royal Flying Corps, um, American pilots in the Royal Flying Corps forming these little sort of Dixie bands that were very highly regarded. So again, you've got lots of professional musicians coming over uh, in the American forces and doing exactly the same thing. And also, you know, it, it had also some unwelcome influences as well. You can see it in, in other forms of life in that traditionally, for example, the Royal Flying Corps traditional game was rugby. Um, by the end of 1917, it was baseball. Uh, not everyone was happy about that, describing it as a, a bit like rounders. <laughs> I was going to ask whether or not this American influence is broadly welcomed or viewed as with a degree of suspicion as virtually everything else the Americans bring is in a kind of a, this isn't, this isn't the music that we want our soldiers listening to. It's a little bit, well, you, you were talking earlier on about fears about degenerate music. I mean, that's a, that's a word that occasionally comes up in the, in the, in regards to how some British officers view everything to do with the American expeditionary forces. I mean, there's also an, a racial element too, isn't there? Because, because it's, it, it's very much associated with black musicians so is is there a, a racist overtone to the critique of this definitely um and it's it's not something i i um you know as as with everything you have to leave so much of what you find out of the book and hopefully you can use it again but of course i'm not sure i showed um it to you i found a wonderful book an edition that was written by an american uh, officer towards the end of the war and it was these little cartoons of, of their black soldiers, illustrations of their black soldiers, but with all of their songs in there and the sort of songs that they were singing while they were out, out working. And again, it's a, it was a really fascinating sort of ethnography of how black soldiers were perceived. And actually, it's, I didn't read and I don't read it as a particularly racist, as in a critical way. They were just fascinated by the tradition that these men had that brought with them of, of songs and singing and as as that sense of of, of teamwork and having that, that that musical tradition in this new experience and it's actually a fascinating publication that i'd quite like to do something more with because you know this this whole sort of study of what soldiers were singing particularly i mean you've got tommy's tunes from 1917 and more tommy's tunes were two songbooks collected by a, a Royal Flying Corps officer and published this sense of sort of capturing um, what soldiers were singing and why, you know, and what all the words were and who sang these words and why and where. That you, you do get the sense that they worried that these, this element of the war was not, it was in no way ephemeral, as I've said, but that it wouldn't last, that it needed to be captured in some way. And this was the way of preserving it. And it's very interesting that, um, that the black soldiers serving in the AEF were, were sort of not studied, but their experience and the way that they um, occupied the aural space as well as the actual wartime space has, has been recorded in this way. And th there's an equivalent, isn't there? Because Shantanu Das has done some work on uh, the Indian soldiers captured by the Germans who, who did do ethnographic studies, but using music and I think getting recording them singing as well as speaking as part of their studies, I, I, I think that's what Shantanu's written about, does it? And, that, and that's what um, that's really really important because that that was the difficult thing about wanting you know I wanted to put a lot more in uh, before, especially uh, Indian soldiers and and the Chinese, you know, all those labour corps soldiers. And I had that picture. Uh, of the Chinese musicians at a YMCA camp because of the YMCA were doing such such a large sort of education program with Indian and Chinese servicemen fighting for the Allies. And but the trouble is, I could only really access their experience via the YMCA because they were the only ones that recorded it. Because these soldiers weren't, you know, a lot of them weren't writing at all because they were um, illiterate, so they're not writing letters home. They're not recording anything in diaries 
no one was interested in their oral histories, recording them afterwards. So their, that sort of element of their musical experiences was all pretty much out of my reach at this point. So it's, it's, it's great that um, uh, Santony Das is, 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 has been doing that work because they're very difficult to to get to. I mean, I think this is quite specific because the Germans were doing this with prisoners of war mm. specifically. Um, and prisoners of war is one of the things that you looked at, isn't it? Music yeah. in POW camps. Yeah. Yeah. The cure for barbed wire disease or for getting mouldy. Yeah. The sense of mouldiness uh, of giving in. But yes, I think music in um, prisoner of war camps was, was quite a chapter to do. Um, particularly as you know covers for escapes um, you know once you've got your concert party that need to be dressing up as women I mean what's stopping them from getting out the front gate we're, we're back to our episode on on films um, aren't we and, and cross-dressing cross-dressing in the British army what are the are the Dominion troops just following the British lead what or, or are the Australians sort of banging out waltzing Matilda at every opportunity or uh... oh waltzing Matilda is like their version of Ata Ferreri that's quite a quite <laughs> They, they have um, yeah, their own distinct cultures, really. And um, a couple of books were, were published uh, around 2014 uh, about uh, the Australians and the New Zealands because they had sort of one or two specific bandmasters who had their own lovely archives. So I was very jealous of this. Um, and the Canadians as well. They were, they were a much easier research for those people because they were sort of all in one place, whereas I had to go here, there and everywhere. There was tiny little tidbits all over the place in, in random boxes that no one had opened uh, pretty much, I think, since about the 19, 1925. You know, it was, it was tiny little bits in lots of different places. But certainly, you know, the Australians you know, and other Dominion forces had their own sort of musical cultures. It was very sort of unit specific on an everyday basis. And then units would come together at sort of more formal concert parties that were touring around. Um, various um, areas of fighting fronts. Do you have a favourite song or musical tradition, unit tradition that you came across? I'm very fond of the Royal Flying Corps. They were absolutely mad, absolutely mad. Um, they sound terrifying. I mean, the Royal Flying Corps did have a, a, a tradition of, of the binge. And when you, you sort of look into their, their, their general their daily life, <laughs> their culture, you're not surprised that they had to get smashed on regular occasions. They would have their drinking songs. They would have very elaborate toasts, drinking games, very complex. But I, I am particularly fond of the Royal Flying Corps. Um, you, you do get some incredibly, uh, very tragic, but also very funny sort of vignettes of, you know, they're, they're in their messes and the orderly has to phone the uh, uh, the, the uh, aerodrome commander saying, sir, they're at it again, um, the, particularly. One, one game was uh, one guy would stand against a dartboard and you can guess what the game was. So they're at it again. Uh, this this would be a few hours into the binge where they would see who could avoid the darts. Um, and they would go off to local towns. Some of them had very bad reputation and they would, they would literally trash local cafes, local restaurants. Um, they'd all go off in their lorry. They'd all come back off their faces and get in their planes uh, and, do, and just practice their loop the loops And, you know, a lot of it, you know, it sounds a little bit Captain Flashheart. But there's a lot of it in the in in the in the record. You know, Captain Flashheart was alive and well, um, and <laughs> pretty much, you know, they were a very interesting group of uh, of guys. But um, they they inhabited a particularly particularly difficult space in that they were often very very young, uh, as you know, as as most of uh, the servicemen were certainly as, as the war went on. But they were a, a particularly interesting group of people and that you know mostly you had to have your own plane so this was sort of self-selected the sort of people that were going into the Royal Flying Corps because it helped if you had your own plane it would cost an arm and a leg sorry that's a terrible pun for them um it would cost a fortune to have your pilot's license just as it does now and get your own plane and you could rock up and join the Royal Flying Corps and they would sort of go and serve and they you know being based in an aerodrome they were very much uh, in a different set of circumstances to those in in, in in the infantry in the trenches because as one of the chaplains said they live in a world where it's white tablecloths and marmalade at breakfast 
two hours later, they're over enemy lines um, getting shot at and may or may not come back at all or, you know, with, with horrific injuries to observers or, you know, the kind of fears that they dealt with and the sort of the combat stress that a lot of them experienced it comes through so much with their songs. I, I wrote an article about combat, you know, the expression of combat um, and the expression of fear. You could never say in the Royal Flying Corps that you were frightened. I mean, obviously, they were all absolutely, you know, understandably terrified all the time, but you could never say that you, you had the wind up because that would, in, you know, that, would, that wouldn't help other people. And that was the ultimate faux pas to say that you were absolutely terrified. But you could sing about it. You could get drunk and you could sing about how many tiny parts your body would be blasted into um, by, by enemy aircraft or, or by, you know, by literally being shot out of the sky. And the ultimate fear um, was um, burning, not, not being killed outright, but a falling on fire. And that's why a lot of RFC, RAF had, had pistols, was literally to you know, ensure that they didn't have that, that experience and that it would be quick. That kind of attitude to it is so enduring because it's basically the entirety of the plot of the Tom Wolfe book, The Right Stuff. Um, that idea of you live fast, you drink fast, you never show that you're afraid because you're going to test yeah. pilot tomorrow and you could something horrible could go wrong. So why not get absolutely smashed out of your brains before lunchtime and then mm. strap yourself to a rocket plane by tea time and see what's the worst that can happen? Exactly. I was, I was going to ask about sort of music as part of invented tradition because this is one of those references that I came across in my PhD and I've been hunting for it ever since. I have no idea where I read this. But talking about the RFC, RAF as, you know, the youngest of the the branches of the military and needing to uh, create a military identity. And one of the ways they do this is these incredibly elaborate uniforms because I was looking at, at masculinity and uniforms at the time. Um, uh, with you know, you get more gold braid on on an RAF uniform than you do on any military or or naval uniform, and that this is partly because they need to assert their uh, identity as as a branch of the armed forces. Is there something about the the music as well, and and clearly not the songs that are dealing or attempting to to negotiate trauma um, and fear? In, but but I'm wondering if if you know, is, is there an element where they're, they're almost more military than the military in terms of the, their song sources, or are they drawing on popular culture in much the same way? Yeah, they're very much trying to establish their own traditions. And there's another, there's a, a Songs for Airmen collection that sort of looked at a lot of the earlier songs and going through to the Second World War, saying, you know, the brown types have got their songs and the sailors have got theirs. These are our own songs. These are coming from the tradition of this new force, you know, that the that the Royal Flying Corps was. We should also mention the Royal Naval Air Service as well, being the sort of the two arms that comprised uh, the uh, the RAF when it comes along in 1918. But certainly, this these new songs that they, I, I found quite a, a, a few references to this idea of, of building a tradition. These are our songs, and a lot of them do come. Um, from sort of the army background because a lot of the men came from uh, you know they transferred over um, from the army to the Royal Flying Corps um, but you see with the Royal Flying Corps a lot of their songs have uh, more to do more in common with the army um, and the Royal Naval Air Service quite quite naturally have uh, a little bit more to do with the navy uh, and certainly that you can see that in 1918 in April 1918 when the RFC and the RAA RNAS come together to form the RAF and suddenly the naval tradition and the army tradition come together and there's one commanding officer that says I've got this guy come from the RNAS and he's he's talking another language um, because they've got different words for everything from toilets to, um, to different ranks so it's very much the idea that these songs are part of their of, of their tradition uh, and that they would always uh, be sung at certain times by, by certain people in certain places. They, 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 this concerts of remembrance, isn't it, from the twenties? What are they? What are the men choosing to sing after the war? Uh, does, does that correlate with what they're singing at the war? Do we get a very specific view of the war of what the ex-servicemen are choosing to sing? 
I think during the war, you get more complaints about pay and conditions, Skilly and Duff. I mean, we're talking about traditions that that's an old, old 19th century, at least Skilly and Duff, Skilly and Duff about, you know, about food, really, about how commanders' wives get food, you know, at, these, at the times where, where wives and children would be with the, stay with the soldiers um, and the other ranks um, would just get the scrags. But yeah, during the war, it's more about conditions, about pay uh, and about food. I think afterwards you get things more like the Long Long Trail, you get um, Roses of Picardy. I think you get the slightly more nostalgic, the slightly more sentimental songs afterwards. Yeah, certainly they are, you know, they're, they're harking back to the, the songs that they would, have, would be singing sort of later on in the evening as they were sort of settling down. I mean, a lot of them are almost lullaby-like uh, in, in many ways. They did like Pack Up Your Troubles, though. That was the really upbeat one. Um, so, you know, the early festivals of remembrance at the Royal Albert Hall from the late 20s onwards, you know, they get together, Pack Up Your Troubles is one, and Roses of Picardy is, is another. But Annie Laurie was the song I used to come across the most. But the, the soldiers would like Annie Laurie quite a lot. A lot of the old folk tunes as well uh, were quite popular, which of course was was encouraged by um, you know those in the, the, the higher musical establishment uh, approved of folk tunes. That, that, that was, you know, it's better a, a good old fashioned folk tune than one of these awful West End shows from a gramophone. Would that be the same for Armistice Day balls? Because presumably those are, you're supposed to be dancing to those, I would imagine. So some of the kind of the, the, the nostalgic melancholy one, you're supposed to be fairly difficult to, to to dance out something resembling well a rhythm to to that. Yeah, and no, I I think by the time you get to the to the balls, you know, they've all probably had a few by then. And that's you're getting the jazz, that's where the jazz comes out, the jazz the jazz bands, you know, the Dixie bands. You know, that's, you know, get, getting into, um, you know, what we what we see is, you know, the roaring 20s and flapper culture is really coming out of uh, of this, really. You know, the, but that American influence is really coming in for those evening dues where, you know, all bets are off. If they've done the, you know, they've sung the hymns at the Remembrance Service, uh, they'd be getting together in their in their units for reunions. They would have an absolute skinful, sing some of their old songs. Uh, and then, obviously, if they if they are like the Charles Carrington type, and they're off to the of the Cafe de Paris, then it's it's onto the Dixie Bands. Then, just moving on in time and, and thinking about the crossover with your your first book, which was on television. What happens to to sort of these songs and soundtracks in later popular culture as we move on into film and television? Is, is there is there a dramatic shift? Or, or what emerges as the, the the most dominant tunes? I mean, obviously, oh, what a lovely war has its own particular history. But um, is that is that the pivotal moment at which the these songs start to accrue a, a, a historical meaning in in other forms of popular culture? I think oh, what a lovely war is is the ultimate, isn't it, of of, of getting those songs together and obviously you know, as, as we all know it tells us much more about the 1960s um, than it does about the Great War itself and certainly that was a, an interesting case in point where this sort of the contemporary me memory through music is, is very important to study because obviously uh, you know the average person in the street would assume that all those songs were popular wartime songs um, so obviously you know Tipperary is in there you know, a lot of the recruitment songs and the way that recruitment was done and the recruitment was parodied. You know, some of those, you know, your country needs you, um, you, know, you know, I'll make a man out of you, all that sort of thing, um, was very unpopular with, with soldiers themselves. You know, they existed, they were around, but the soldiers really very much disliked any sort of overt patriotism. You know, if patriotism was going to be sung about, it was going to normally be parodied. It was an object of, of satire. Uh, poking fun at uh, exactly the sort of situations that are portrayed in Oh What a Lovely War, about you know the role of women particularly, um, getting men up on stage, that sort of thing. So yes, it really does show that um, some songs are in our popular contemporary memory of, of the Great War that don't actually deserve to be in there. I wondered as well if some songs have become. Uh, you see, the one I was thinking of, "Keep the Home Fires Burning," is actually it's played at a, it's 
it's been sentimentalised now. If you listen to it, it seems it's much slower than the uh, John McCormack version from 1915, which skips along quite quick compared to now. Where you, you know, it, it, it's you could just sort of see it with fields of poppies in slow motion. Uh, you played on the TV with it in the background. Well, it, was, it was used as the sort of theme tune of the BBC's centenary commemorations. Um, uh, a lot of, I just remember being in, in a lot of radio studios and, and coming in after that being played for about three years um, and, and has very much become popularised that oh. way. I mean, Keep the Home Fires Burning is probably the one if ever I'm asked, it was there a song that the home front and the fighting fronts agreed on? Keep the home fires burning was probably the one that soldiers didn't mind too much, and the civilians quite liked as well. That was suitable for civilians because I mean most servicemen wouldn't have sung any of the songs they sing in the fighting areas to their mothers or sisters. <laughs> so you know, keep the home fires burning is probably the the one of the few songs that both you know occupied both a civilian and a military space and was acceptable to to, to both of them because. It, it had that sort of soft yearning for home. Um, you know, it wasn't particularly uh, rude or crude uh, for civilians. And it had that sort of lilting inoffensiveness that the soldiers could accept. So I keep the home fires burning was certainly one. But I mean, Ivan Novello is, um, he's, he's fascinating talking about the Royal Naval Air Service. Um, they decided very early on that he was much safer on a concert platform than he was in a plane. So yes, he's, he it really brings his career to the fore, uh, and he he's in he goes out in the second wave of YMCA concert parties with Lena Ashwell, a young Ivan Abello. I think he was still in his teens, late teens then, described as a young new young Welsh tenor. But yes, he uh, he very quickly uh, gets gets safely put uh, parked away in in London at some part of the Admiralty uh, after a very inglorious few months with some aircraft they couldn't spare any more I don't think but the the morale value of having of, of, of having him there and, and appearing in various things um and obviously he was writing um writing his music and and, and making a name for himself there so um certainly keep the home fires burning is is a song that everyone could agree on was acceptable are there other examples of uh Soldiers in the trenches who are also acting as composers who've become, you know, either briefly famous in the interwar years or kind of rise in, in profile by composing new music whilst on war service? Or is it a lot of it kind of reproducing music that is already in existence? Um, it's such a mishmash. There is a real mishmash. But obviously you've got people like, you know, George Butterworth was out there, although he didn't write more. I mean, Henry Wolford Davis is, is the ultimate um, person, you know, because in his pastoral symphony has that... Um, you know, the trumpet has an off-key uh, figure in, in, in the slow movement there, and that's very much referencing Henry Walford Davis hearing a bugler practice out in France and always hit, hitting the wrong, not quite hitting the note that he should have done. But certainly Mademoiselle d'Armentier, everyone's favourite song, certainly I've still not quite recovered from Mark Connolly showing the full actual lyrics of that to the Gateways Conference once. I'll play it. Yeah, which version have you got? Oh, it's the only one I could find. This is the, um, it's from, is it from the uh, Jackson? Which is probably the, the most um, sort of accurately uh, explosive uh, account of the Great War, isn't it? Mademoiselle from Armatiers, parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armatiers, parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armentis, she hasn't been kissed in 40 years, inky dinky parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armentis, parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armentis, parlez-vous. Our top kick in Armentis broke the spell of 40 years, inky dinky parlez-vous. The feeling that them in, um, some of the original or the, the, the more vulgar lyrics, I should say, um, ended up in um, uh, Middle Parts of Fortune, mm-hmm. the Frederick Manning. Mm-hmm. Which is probably mm-hmm. the, the most um, sort of accurately uh, explosive uh, account of the Great War, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's the one that you ask any former soldier and they say, yeah, that gets what it was like to be a soldier, you know, in any 
conflict um, most accurately. Yeah. But certainly that, that was uh, said to be composed by uh, Lieutenant Gitz Ingham Rice, um, Lieutenant Gitz Ingraham Rice, I should say. He was uh, a Canadian uh, member of the Canadian Expeditionary Force in a Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. Um, See, I just it, it, so he composed that. Ch- I assumed that the tune was there, and someone just by osmosis put words to it, and they grew over time to to what they were. He's, he's generally, than... yeah, he's generally credited as as the uh, the composer of that one. Said to be inspired by a barmaid he observed serving drinks to soldiers when he was in in that area. Um, but he also, you know, he writes Dear Old Pal of Mine, uh, which is another John McCormack uh, performance. Um, also, The Conscientious Objector's Lament, often known for God's sake, Don't Send Me, uh, which um, he composed for Round the Map, uh, which was sung, uh, appeared Alfred Lester, uh, another big voice. So um, people like Rice, you know, he's, he's what, just one example um, of a, a more popular composer. Obviously, Wilfred Davis is is, um, is is an easy is an easy target for that one, but certainly uh, Gitz Rice is a very is, is a much is a much richer, more example of music actually on the ground and a sort of more popular uh, example. Is there examples of big hits at the time, or popular popular tunes, maybe not hits, but popular tunes at the time that that we've forgotten that somehow you don't make it into soundtracks and things like that, and have just sort of disappeared. Well, anything from those big shows like Choo Chin Chow, Made of the Mountains, uh, Round the Map, all of those shows had these, you know, various songs that we now recognise as as popular First World War songs that were taken up very heartily by soldiers because that was obviously the first thing that they did. If they had a couple of days leave, a lot of them couldn't go up, you know, home to Durham. They would just end up coming back on the, you know, getting a troop ship over to Folkestone, train up to London, have a day or two in London, staying at the uh, YMCA hostel normally, go to a show, a couple of shows, and then they'd be back on the front, you know, back in with their units. So, you know, this idea of, you know, certainly the, the West End shows and the music of those shows has such an influence on the popular music of servicemen because that was the thing to do, um, to go over. And if they were ever going into any sort of uh, canteen hut or any bar or any club. This is still the music that, that would be most likely played. I can't help feel that something like um, uh, there's a long, long trail. Sometimes it's a big track at the time, but actually it seems to be completely forgotten now. Not forgot, you know, in certain spheres it's clearly not forgotten, but it's not a popular tune now that it was at the, was then. Is there other? Does it? Is that, and do they get forgotten because they somehow don't fit a certain sentimentality that we expect from a First World War tune? Well, I think Long Long Trail is certainly, um, you know, certainly in there. It's probably one of the ones they used to sing after the war. Um, you know, that comes along later in the war. Um, but you know, you've got um, "I Want to Go Home," "Dear Old Pal of Mine." Um, you know, I want to go home is always funny because apparently German, the German soldiers used to hear um, people saying, you know, British soldiers saying, I want to go home. And obviously being German, taking it very literally. I said, oh, they, you know, the British are about to give up. They're singing, I want to go home. Um, but then, you know, it's just the soldier's humour. Colonel Bogey is another one. Are we downhearted? Songs like that. Um, I don't want to join the army. You know, which obviously, you know, I don't want to join the Air Force. You know, I went to the RFC um, very quickly. Um, there's, there's, there's a whole raft of songs. And I think that was the frustration with the book, was only the feeling that I really was only skimming, the, you know, a lot of skimming the surface of what, what they probably did sing. Um, well, Down Hearty gets picked up by French civilians incredibly quickly. They're, they're shouting it and singing at guys coming off the boats in August uh, 1914. And it's already mm. made headway into French culture enough that they recognise that if they sing it, British soldiers will like it. Yeah, anything, especially that has a response as well. Who's who's your lady friend? It would always be who who who's your lady friend? Because you can tell that the the, the letters get get bigger, um, you know, and, and into capitals uh, to sort of you know this this sense of songs that you could shout, not so much singing, shouting. I think that was. That was that was quite interesting. I really wanted to get down to the granular level of what this sounded like. And there's one 
you know, uh, one chaplain's account of soldiers singing in a church or soldiers singing hymns for religious purposes, very different types of voices than what they sound like when they're doing something else. So this idea of shouting is really good. And certainly the Royal Flying Corps, you know, so a lot of their drinking songs, you know, some of them say, we've got no idea what it means, but it's great to shout. Yeah, Napu. Napu was one. Um, he said, I've got no idea what it means, but it's great to shout when you're ginned. Um, that's, that, that's the one. On, on, on the flip side, I have a lovely story from um, my first book of a man in a, uh, an officer in a training camp who there's, there's a ban on speaking after taps um, and the men in the tent next to him are whispering, keep the home fires burning very, very quietly. So he's trying to try and get around the sergeant major. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Skibu, that's one of the favourite ones. There's a skibu. I've got no idea what it means, but it's very good for yelling at the top of your voice when you're ginned. But certainly, you know, the uh, in, you know, in the army as well, some of them saying um, some of the songs were most profane. After you've had half a dozen beers, the world was quite a good place. So it, the, a real thing, This it, the link between some of these songs and drinking is very, very strong, shall we say. But I would say a suggestion, Angus, uh, when we were talking about combat fear, combat stress uh, and the Royal Flying Corps, that Archibald certainly not is uh, is the one that they used to sing, uh, apparently, um, your playlist, Archibald certainly not. So that, that's what they used to, apparently, what they used to sing in the cockpit um, to take their mind off being shot at. Archibald certainly not. It's quite funny. There's no use me denying that. I'm in fact, you can see. It was on my wedding morn, my wife commenced to pick at me. The wedding breakfast over, I said, let's start off today upon our honeymoon. But she said, what waste time that way? Archibald? Certainly not. Get back at once to work now on the spot. When single, we could waste time spooning, but lose work now for honeymooning. Archibald? Certainly not. It's um, very reminiscent of uh, oh, Albert and the Lion. Who did Albert and the Lion? Mm, uh, Stanley, Stanley Holloway. Uh, yes. That kind of spoken monologue. Uh, well, it's and and fla- it's you know it's the Flanders and Swan. I think again, yeah. just to just to talk about yeah. a bit more of your playlist there, if yeah. you wanted to add add to it, that that sort of sense of nonsense yeah. that we were just talking about about Skibu and about shouting. Um, you know, songs like Sister Susie's Sewing Shirts for Soldiers. There's also pa- uh, Patty's Packing Parcels for Something, Something Else. These, this sort of sense of losing yourself in nonsense. A, a tongue twister. This is Sister Susie's Sewing Shirts for so, so, Sister Susie's sewing, sewing Shirts for Soldiers. Sister Susie sewing in the kitchen on a singer. There's miles and miles of flannel on the floor and up the stairs. idea of that sort of song the, the tongue twister particularly at home in the in the theatres would be the big sing-along and to do the tongue twister and just have a bit of nonsense I mean, a, apart from all the um, you know the double meanings in there you know sister Susie sewing shirts for soldiers not in a time of khaki figure chasing after soldiers in the streets apparently um is um you know getting audiences so involved with with that so they're sort of taking them out of themselves um a little bit so um you know soldiers and and civilians you know that's not particularly a song that would have traveled particularly well over you know not something that i would have thought would be sung that often on the march but certainly soldiers would enjoy you know a bit of leave going to the theater and losing themselves in tongue twisting nonsense um 
is, is there a revival of Gilbert and Sullivan? I'm just thinking of the Patter songs as as doing something similar. Well, yeah, potentially. Gilbert and Sullivan has a massive uh, is a is a big part of naval tradition anyway, and certainly in in naval officers before um, before the the outbreak of war, they would always put the Gilbert and Sullivan on at the end of term. Um, that would be part of what would happen at, at Dartmouth uh, and, at, and at Greenwich, and that that was part of theirs. And and certainly a brother was someone who was quite closely involved with with those uh, with the Doily Carts uh, Company, who used to produce a lot of Gilbert and Sullivan. Was a commander on one of the ships um, of of my bands, one of my uh, uh, Royal Marine bandsmen. So he's in there because he'd get them sheet music from the theatre on onto his ship. And it used to take great, um, great interest in the rehearsals and, and come in and direct them a little bit, uh, the captain of this ship. So yes, Gilbert and Sullivan is is a is a huge part of the of, of the naval tradition. You, I don't think you could have a naval get together of any form without any Gilbert and Sullivan in it on any ranks. And it is interesting actually how um, a lot of songs from the First World War come back. They're brought back almost deliberately in the Second World War. You know there are. Ivan Novello comes back with, you know, we'll be gathering lilacs, um, but it's home fires. Keep the home fires burning is the one that is, comes back a lot more. Um, you know, so you, you do see that in the, in the Second World War, that um, you know, their father's songs, you know, the, the generation before that fought the Great War, you know, their songs are often the ones that are brought back into the forces. Um, so, again, that's, that's quite an interesting avenue of, of study mm. as well. Mm. Although my dad came out the second world war just obsessed with uh, Glenn Miller, although as my as my mother will tell you, he was obsessed with Glenn Miller and hummed them all at the wrong wrong speed. So it's in the mood, got really fast or really slow. I'm trying to. It was, it was slow. I think it was all slow. It was all slow. <laughs> oh, um, I was just wondering if you shouldn't play us out with "Till We Meet Again." There, uh, Angus. Till we meet again. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> seem appropriate given that it's been lovely having you back oh, can i just say um so nice to thank you i'm very yes. honored I, i'm your july slot because it was last july wasn't it you I'm, are i'm yeah. very happy i've got another book to vlog we'll have to make this an annual event frontline cinemas <laughs> is that hey is, is that all the abolition Perfect. of the military death penalty which one do you want to go with frontline cinemas yeah. cinemas <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we'll leave you with uh, Till We Meet Again. Here we go. Till we meet again.